Lots of people are confused about Islam because they're getting so much conflicting information from so many different directions. Muslims around the world have been rioting and killing while demanding Sharia blasphemy laws. But here in America, Muslims have been calling for peace and tolerance while demanding Sharia blasphemy laws. It's all very confusing. I open up the Quran and see that it commands Muslims to fight those who do not believe in Allah. It commands Muslims not to be friends with Jews and Christians. It defines Muslims as those who fight in Allah's way by slaying and getting slain. But then I turn on ABC News and hear that Islam doesn't teach any of this. So who speaks for Islam, the Quran or Diane Sawyer? I don't know. I'm confused. I open the Hadith and find out that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl and that he had sex with his slave girls, and that he allowed his followers to rape their female captives. Then Muslims tell me that Muhammad was the most wonderful man in history, a champion of women's rights. Who's telling the truth about Muhammad, Islam's most trusted sources, or a bunch of westernized Muslims who believe in a watered-down, whitewashed Walt Disney version of their prophet? I just don't know. But if you're as confused as I am about Islam, today is your lucky day. Because we've got Muhammad himself with us to answer all our tough questions about the religion of peace, bloodshed, and perpetual whining. Muhammad, so nice of you to drop by. I love what you've done with your hair, by the way. I have to say, though, that you're a lot smaller in person than I would have expected, given the genuinely global nature of the murderous rampages that you've caused. Your followers have carried out nearly 20,000 terrorist attacks since they destroyed the World Trade Center, and they've killed more than 270 million people over the past 14 centuries. How does it feel knowing that you've inspired more senseless violence than any other leader in history, religious or non-religious? Does it make you feel important? Muhammad, as you know, there's a reason your chair is empty. If I were to put someone in this chair and say, it's Jesus, no one would die. If I put someone in this chair and said, it's Moses, I wouldn't hear a peep from any Jews. I could put a Barbie doll here and say, it's Richard Dawkins. Atheists aren't going to go on a killing spree. I could even put something in this chair and say it's God, and no one would care. But if anyone or anything were in this chair right now, and I said it's you, people halfway around the world that I've never met might get massacred. Don't you find it a little strange that you've commanded people to believe in you, and yet we can't even have an open, honest discussion about you because your followers are so prone to butchering people who question your teachings? Let's talk about consistency, Muhammad. Lots of people are complaining about Pamela Geller's subway ads because she calls terrorists savages. It's now hate speech to say something offensive about a jihadist blowing up a busload of people. But I open up your book, Muhammad, and I read Surah 98.6, which says, Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad, from among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, and al-Mushrikun will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. Christians and Jews who reject you, according to your book, are the worst of creatures. We're lower than pigs. We're lower than dogs. We may even be lower than women. Right, Muhammad? Teachings like this are the reason jihadists don't have any problem blowing up a busload of Jews. Jews are the worst of creatures, according to the Quran. What difference does it make if a busload of them are slaughtered? My question for you is this. If calling someone a savage because of behavior, which by definition is savage, qualifies as hate speech, doesn't your book qualify as a far greater form of hate speech? After all, a savage is still a human being. Savages are just people who are uncivilized. But your book calls us subhuman, less than animals. Not because we're blowing up children, but because of our beliefs. Don't you think it's utterly hypocritical for the media and judges and politicians to condemn Pamela Geller 
who's simply stating the obvious, but not to condemn your teachings, which actually do call for outright hatred of specific groups of people. I should probably add, while I've got you here, that you don't just call us names. You also command your followers to violently subjugate us. In Surah 929, you order Muslims to fight those who believe not in Allah. I notice that the Quran is commanding you to fight people based on what they believe. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. You order your followers to fight us because of our beliefs until we acknowledge our inferiority. So you're not just calling Jews and Christians the worst of creatures, you're also commanding your followers to fight Jews and Christians because of our beliefs. So tell me, why is it perfectly acceptable for you to attack non-Muslims, both with name-calling and with physical violence, but it's a symptom of bigotry and racism and the imaginary mental disease of Islamophobia for anyone to so much as question your teachings. Could you explain that for us? I'd like to continue with the issue of consistency, if you don't mind. Muslims around the globe are calling for blasphemy laws. They're claiming that it's wrong and immoral to say mean things about other people's religious beliefs and that the world needs to make such behavior illegal. But wouldn't these laws simply add to your already rather lengthy rap sheet? In al Tabari's history, we read about your interactions with the pagans of Mecca. The messenger of God, that'd be you, proclaimed God's message openly and declared Islam publicly to his fellow tribesmen. When he did so, they did not withdraw from him or reject him in any way, as far as I have heard, until he spoke of their gods and denounced them. According to Muslim sources, then, the pagans of Mecca didn't have any problem with you preaching Islam until you started denouncing their gods. But now I'm confused because your followers are calling for laws against this sort of thing. A few pages later in al Tabari, the pagans complain about your intolerance. They say, We have never seen the like of what we in have endured from this man. He has derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers, reviled our religion, caused division among us, and insulted our gods. We have endured a great deal from him. You abused their forefathers, reviled their religion, and insulted their gods? Why would you do that, Muhammad? Didn't you realize that it's wrong to act that way and that such religious intolerance should be illegal? Things get even worse when we read about the kinds of things that you and your companions were saying about their gods and their forefathers. For instance, you told your companion, Ubay ibn Kab, how to respond to pagans who boasted about their family line. I'm sure you'll remember telling him, if anyone proudly asserts his descent in the manner of pre-Islamic people, tell him to bite his, his father's penis and do not use a euphemism. Bite his father's penis? That's how you talk to people? You kiss your child bride with that mouth? What kind of example were you setting for Muslims, Muhammad? Well, we know exactly what kind of example you set because we know how your father followers acted in your presence. You were there when a pagan named Urwa tried to reason with you and tried to convince you not to attack your own tribe. Do you remember what Abu Bakr said to him? Abu Bakr, your closest friend and the first rightly guided caliph, said to him, Go suck the clitoris of Alat. Alat was the goddess that this man believed in. Why didn't you rebuke Abu Bakr for saying something so offensive and so childish about this man's religious beliefs, Muhammad? Oh, I forgot. You taught your followers 
to insult people's religious beliefs. But you didn't stop at insults, did you? What did you do when you conquered Mecca, Muhammad? Did you show any respect at all for the religious beliefs of the people there? No, you went to their shrine, the Kaaba, you smashed their 360 idols, and you took over their shrine. You know, Muhammad, they believed in those idols. Why did you smash them? I thought we were supposed to respect the religious feelings of people we disagree with. Don't you think that smashing their idols and strong-arming their shrine hurt their feelings? To this day, when your followers pray, they bow down to a shrine that they took by force from members of a different religion. When I ask your followers about this, they say, well, we believe it was our shrine all along, and we don't believe in their false gods. And here we come to the crux of the matter. You and your companions didn't show the slightest respect or concern for the beliefs of non-Muslims. You mocked their beliefs. You called them names. You smashed their idols. You stole their shrine. All because you didn't believe the same things they believed. Guess what, Muhammad? I don't believe in you. I don't believe you're a prophet. I don't believe in your God. I don't believe in your book. So, if I were to follow the example set by you and your companions and your followers today, what should I do? Should I tell your followers to bite your penis? You said no euphemisms. Should I tell them to perform a little cunnilingus on Allah? No euphemisms now. Should I smash your book to pieces? Or should I go all Mona al Tahawi on it? Isn't it ironic, Muhammad, that your followers today tell people that you're the greatest moral example in history, and yet the Muslims watching this video right now are absolutely horrified at the thought of me acting like you? But you can tell your followers not to worry, Muhammad, because I'm as horrified at the thought of acting like you as they are.